Hi, my name is Jordan Sheila. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, I currently live in Beijing. And I'm here at Berlinale with my second feature film, a documentary entitled The Silk and the Flame. I feel miserable these these two days. Every time he stare at me, it seems I did something wrong. It seems he's always observing me. He's trying to find the truth. I'm Hannah Congdon and I'm here talking with Jordan Sheila about his new documentary, The Silk and the Flame. Hi Jordan. Hi Hannah, how Welcome are you? Welcome to the Berlinale. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, this is uh, your second time having a film screening uh, in the panorama section, so mm. how does that feel? Um, I still don't believe it until the film actually screens, so yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting till Monday, our world yeah. premiere, um, but it, it feels incredible. I'm so honored to be back and I also think that uh, Panorama is, is really a perfect platform to share this particular film. So I'm yeah. really honored and grateful to be back with, the, with this particular film. Yeah. And um, in 2016, you had uh, the fiction film Dog Days, and mm. you've now come back with um, a feature-length documentary. Mm. Can you tell me about the transition between those two films? Yeah, actually, um, I think there is a relationship because Dog Days was very much um, born out of some experiences that I first had when I lived in China and I moved mm. there. And The Silk and the Flame, I uh, was born out of uh, other experiences that I had in China once I had shot my first feature film. Mm -hmm. um, the main difference between the two films, other than one is a fiction, one is a documentary, is that The Silk and the Flame was really a passion project that I worked on for um, a couple of years and uh, along the way found some people to support me. But it was something that I wanted to do once in my life that was a film where um, there weren't too many external forces shaping how the film was made. Um, whereas uh, Dog Days was also a passion project, but with many more people involved and many more parameters. Uh, so The Silk and the Flame was also a reaction in a way. Um, it wasn't just a story that I really wanted to tell. It was also a film that I felt I had to make that could be my own and uh, regardless of how it turned out, if it had such an amazing opportunity to show at Berlinale, it was a film that I, I really wanted to make at least once in my life. Yeah. And when you say it was a film that you really wanted to make, the story centers around um, Yao and his family. Mm. Um, and I wanted to know how you came across him, how you mm. got to know more about his story and why you particularly wanted to tell that story. Um, so Yao, who's an exceptional person, was someone I met um, in the art scene in Beijing. The art scene being uh, different dance performances and musical shows and exhibitions uh, because the company that he started, um, not just Chinese cultural exhibitions and performances, but also, for instance, they, they recently, his company recently did something from the UK that was very big. So I met him through mutual friends who were involved in the dance and uh, music scene in Beijing which is, uh, you know, an incredible scene. And uh, we actually met then just by attending performances and exhibitions together, and he introduced me to a whole world of culture that I hadn't had access to before. Along the way, I felt that Yao um, was an incredible storyteller. Um, for a couple of years, he had shared his own personal stories, mm -hmm. and 
when I would listen to these stories, I felt I was reading a memoir. And eventually, we became good friends, and his family invited me to visit, um, and I did visit. And I was sort of the unofficial photographer of the village, because yeah. <laughs> they had never met a Westerner before, and they had never been photographed before like that, other than with like you know phones. That, um, so they invited me back, and I asked if I could also film, and they were more than happy for me to film there. So. Um, that's pretty much, uh, it was over a period of a few years that we became good friends and I recognized that he was, it's not just me as a storyteller in this film, it's also very much him. Yeah. Uh, he is the narrator, he is the voice of the film. And was he, he completely happy to share, I mean it's quite intimate, was he very happy to share all of that with, with I think for him camera? it was cathartic. Uh, I think it was something of course that he was uh, a bit nervous to do at first. Um, but for me, if the film works for an audience, I think it's in large part because he's very willing to share some things that many of us aren't willing to share, not just in front of camera, but with even you know friends or family. Um, so once he saw the film, I think the first 10 or 15 minutes, he didn't realize um, how it would turn out. And he was very anxious while watching it. He had to stop it a couple of times. But by the end of the film, I think uh, he, was, he was quite moved. Um, he said he loved it because I think as a storyteller, there's this sort of uh, need within us to express something and for it to be remembered and shared. And I think for him, this is sort of a document that he can take with him for the rest of his life about his struggle, yeah. about his strength. Um, and hopefully, like as it did for me, inspire other people. Yeah. yeah. And you shot all of the footage yourself, is that right? Uh, with the exception of one or two shots that maybe one of his nephews, uh, he stole the camera, he yeah. shot something, and I was looking at the footage and thought, hey, that's pretty good. I shot the rest of the film, yeah, okay. so I shot the film on my own. So hence that very personal element. In a way, it's my, yeah, I think it's the most personal film I've made because uh, it was also a learning experience for me. I, I, you know, I'm the director, the producer, and the writer as well, and the, pro yeah. and the editor. Um, it's a the, good job. <laughs> it was... Uh, it really was a passion project, that's all I can say. I mean, it, wasn't, it was something that, uh, you know, I'd stay up in the middle of the night working on, you know, for yeah. the last year and a half. Um, and uh, would, I would go back to shoot more if I felt something was missing or back to record more. And um, it, it's, it's one of those experiences I had in my life where um, I think a lot of artists, especially like filmmakers, can get really caught up in their work and nothing mm -hmm. else matters when they're like, for instance, on set shooting. Yeah. And for me, this feeling was heightened and amplified because it wasn't just when we were shooting, it was when I was at home editing the film or when I was getting in touch with producers or organizations to help me finish yeah. the film. Yeah. So the film uh, takes place in the Chinese New Year, mm. um, which is... I think happening very, right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, I saw that. Um, and that's a very big family celebration, and family is a very big topic in the film. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the place that family has in Chinese culture generally? Um, it's really the bedrock of, I mean, you could say that about many cultures, but in China, um, in part because Confucian values are, you know, many religions that, for instance, exist in China, whether it's Buddhism or other religions, they, they're not native to China, but Confucianism and Taoism are both Chinese concepts. And so Confucianism is very much embedded, even for young people today, in their relationships uh, professionally, personally, with their families, with their teachers. And so um, it's something that they can't really escape. Um, people will joke about it, uh, they'll say that it's kind of a traditional uh, way of living, but even young people there often have a deep reverence for their families and for their traditions. Um, so the family is something that I think is not only important to people emotionally, but it's sort of the, the nucleus of Chinese society. Even the way that you know, organizations, companies, I think government are run, the, the influence that Confucianism has had on the culture is still very much present. And Yao yeah, himself, he talks a lot about family in the film, in his narration. Mm. And his idea of family, I think, doesn't quite fit in with this wider concept of family. He mm. talks about um, family being something in which you should feel free to do whatever you want, and mm. he certainly doesn't in this and situation. And have the support for that, yeah. What was his experience of, of having to reconcile those two different ideas of family in his mind? Uh, 
Yao is a special case in that he supports his entire family, mm. um, but he doesn't live with them. And he only sees them once a year. Uh, sometimes he'll go home more than once a year, but primarily once a year. And so he, in a way, is the, the guardian of the family. And yet he is the only one in the family that openly, at least with some of his friends, mm -hmm. expresses a need to be cared for and protected. Yeah. Um, so there's this dichotomy in, in the person that he is, and that he's someone who very much needs that kind of support that he's giving to the rest of his family. Um, the, the funny thing is, when I, when I watched the film recently, um, there's like a scene when it introduces the family, all the members, and, yeah. and they come in, you know, a couple at a time. It's bigger and, and bigger. We're understanding. And, and, and the initial idea of that was to, to show um, what, how his mind is thinking about the makeup of his family and how large it feels to him. But in the end, actually, his, his family is large, but it's not that large. And so that the way that he expresses the size of his family, I think, is actually more de demonstrative of, of how much of a weight that he feels in trying to support them on his own. Is that because, yeah. so it's the financial reason, when he's saying that he wants a family, or he would ideally have a family that's yeah. smaller, is that purely financial, you think? I think a lot of it's financial, but I think a lot of it is also, he's a problem solver, not just in uh, financial problems. I think he... Um, his sister especially and the kids turn to him for advice. Mm. That's sort of, and it was one of the things that I really hope to get at in the film that he's, he's a hero. You know, he's actually a very strong figure. We see his vulnerability in the film. Uh, we see that he's a pariah. We see that he has a lot of uh, unfulfilled wishes. But I think he's also an incredibly courageous and strong person. And uh, I think a lot of that has to do with not just him financially supporting the family, but devoting a great deal of his energy, his emotional energy, and his time to advising the family, um, trying to make their lives better, um, thinking about ways to, like an example would be recently, um, he was thinking of a way to help his sister's husband find work and uh, get training because he's an unskilled worker. And so part of this is financial, but part of this I think is he gives a lot of time and effort thinking about what would this person like to do. And so the irony is that it, it's not that they're to blame, but he is living a life that is not necessarily the life he wants to live, but he's always trying to think of a way to find uh, a better life for the people around him and one that they want to live. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also, it's not just the expectation of his own family, there's a lot of references to what other members of the village or other families in the village yeah. feel. Is that a very big pressure um, yeah. for individuals in living in this yeah, yeah. village culture? I would say even in a city, you know, I, when I was living in Beijing, I lived in the, the Hutong, which is like the very local alleyway homes yeah. in Beijing for a couple of years. And everyone knows each other's business. And, um, you know, so the, the idea of a community, again, it, it has to do with this uh, sort of structure of Chinese society. There's the family, there's the community, the society, but, but they're all very closely related and everyone is very curious about everyone else's affairs. In a village, it's particularly uh, difficult for someone who is, say, a minority, because, for instance, not just someone who is uh, homosexual, but someone who is deaf and mute, for instance, because the larger a family is in a village, the more power they have, the more say they have. And Yao's family, his father was an orphan as well, who had returned to the village during the Chinese Civil War. And so his father had been bullied for... Every, initially, he was welcomed back to the village because he had some skills. He knew how to build rice fields. and um, So the village welcomed his return. But when the government gave him land, they no longer wanted him there. So his father has had this lifelong dream of building a family that is large so that way that they can defend themselves in the village. And so Yao, um, it's very difficult for him to uh, sort of earn the respect and not be bullied by anyone uh, in the village who sees him as, as weak because um, he hasn't fulfilled this one duty of expanding the family. Yeah. yeah. And that duty um, and the pressure of that duty comes also a lot mm. from his father yes. who plays a bit of a conflicting role in his life. Mm. His, the father seems to be very gentle and caring or ha we know he has been gentle and caring with wife. the mother yeah. uh, but not so much with Yao and seemingly specifically because of the issue of homosexuality. Yeah. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I think they're related actually. Uh, 
it, it's, uh, it's interesting because we learn that his father had devoted a great deal of his life to trying to cure the mother or um, at least help her by inventing this sign language for her. Um, Yah was born illegally and at, at the time the family had to pay a huge fine to keep him. And this fine prevented them from leaving the village and maybe, uh, you see the father really I hope something else that comes through is that the love story between his parents is also very much related to his own identity because their love story is what has driven his father to want to improve the lives of the family. And by, you know, of course it's not his fault, but by being born he brought this um, burden to his family. This is, this is the way his father thinks. And it prevented them from ever leaving the village, and for, pre it prevented him from taking Yao's mother somewhere else, maybe to see the world. Um, at one point in the film, she says, "You know, since since he's had his strokes, Yao's father has had a stroke. We haven't been able to travel anywhere." And so, the the sadness is that that the, why it's bittersweet is that we can experience the affection between them. I think it's there very much, but um, in her mind. There's not much hope for the future in terms of, you know, her relationship with her husband. Like they're sort of, yeah, yeah they're sort of stuck in the past. Yeah. And with um, both the mother and the father, there is this issue of communication. The father's almost silent the whole mm -hmm. film. The mother That's is right. uh, unable to speak, so has her own different language. Mm -hmm. And Yao as well is unable to communicate his sexuality, is unable to fully express himself. Mm -hmm. Can you expand a little bit more on those parallels of a lack of communication that's here? I think the film is very much about a family um, that desperately wants to communicate, um, but can't. And the reasons why they can't is that each of them wants something else for the family. Uh, the father wants his son to fulfill his duties, expand the family. Um, the son wants to confide in us as an audience, and that's also why he speaks in English when he, when he talks to us, um, or when he doesn't want his family to understand what he's saying. Uh, because English is actually a way for him to escape being heard. Mm. It, it's a sense, it's, 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 a, it's a liberating space for him in a and way. And he swaps between the languages, doesn't he? And he swaps himself. between the languages, but he swaps only when he wants to be heard by us. And when he communicates with his family, it's, it's sort of his retreat to his duties as the, as the son of the family. Um, the, mother, the mother, for me, was a very powerful figure when I first met her. Um, because she had lost her voice through a medical accident when she was six or seven. Uh, she didn't lose her voice, she lost the ability to speak uh, words. Uh, and she still has her voice, um, and she still remembers what it was like to be able to express herself um, in a very precise way. And so when she uses the sign language that her husband invented for her, she often screams or she makes this... The it's first quite painful sometimes. It's, it. Yes, it's quite painful. And the family has heard this their entire lives, so it's something that they're used to. But I remember the first time I hadn't entered the house yet where his parents live, and um, I thought someone, I, I thought something uh, was uh, terribly wrong at first. That's I thought exactly someone what was I was being... thinking in this opening shot where yeah. we only hear it from the outside. It yeah. sounds painful. Yeah. And then you realize eventually that. Yeah, I remember it's rushing into the house and in Yao, for him, it, he, he, he's grown up with it. So for him, it, he didn't think twice about it. But, uh, and for me, that, that sound is uh, not only very much in the film, but very representative of all three characters, where I think all of them have a very strong desire to say what they want from the other people in this family, specifically Yao, and, and, and yet um, they're unable to communicate in their own ways. Uh, Yao is the voice of the film, he's the narrator, but uh, he cannot be openly, uh, you know, uh, cannot speak openly with his parents. Um, his mother physically cannot speak words, but she is perhaps the loudest voice in the film. Yeah. And the father only chooses once to speak in the film. Um, so he still has the ability, but he's given up on it. I mean, and there's also that irony where, you know, the wife, uh, his, his wife, Yao's mother, can still speak, uh, can't, can't speak anymore, but she, she wants to so badly. And the father can speak, but he chooses not to. Yeah. Hmm. And. The issue of marriage comes up quite a lot. It's an interesting yeah. representation of marriage because 
generally it's quite negative. So the, the <laughs> yeah. mother was beaten in her first marriage. Mm. Yao is crippled by this pressure to be married and to have this woman to present at home. Mm. And then I was thinking about the kind of fake girlfriends or fake fiancés and how they <laughs> must feel as well and how they must feel that same pressure yeah. in order to go into that situation. Yeah. Is marriage this incredibly important institution in China and do you see it as a negative? Do I personally see it as a... Yeah. You mean marriage in China, just marriage in general? <laughs> Either, both. <laughs> um, we'll start with marriage in China. Um, China is a specific case because even legally um, there are repercussions if you're not married and you have children. Um, it's illegal to, to uh, have children without being married. Um, Dog, my first feature film is also about this a little bit. Um, so if you're born into a system with, uh, out of wedlock, um, with your parents out of wedlock, then uh, you don't have access to the social system because you were, you were born illegally. Um, so marriage has very practical implications in China, maybe more than abroad uh, or outside of China. Um, I think it, it, it's not just Confucianism. I think it's also the deeply embedded values of Taoism that value sort of harmony and balance. And I think that is very important to Chinese culture. Um, where I come from, especially nowadays, I see a lot of, you know, in the United States, I see a lot of uh, extreme uh, ideas, uh, not just in one direction, but in all directions. And uh, one can make the argument that China is very much, um, it's not that it's a practical society, but that they value a sense of equilibrium and stability and predictability. And, uh, and the reason why they value this is because, as we said earlier, the family is, so, is the bedrock, I think, of yeah. culture there. Um, and without it, uh, you're susceptible to um, things that I think, for instance, Chinese parents want to protect their children from. Um, personally, I think marriage, like any, like anything, is just, is just. I mean, it's for me, it's a very personal choice, and and it's something that. Um, it's not only something that I think a person wants; it's something that other people want for a person. So, even though in. We, we may think of marriage in China as something very different from where we come from. I th also think, for instance, like a wedding. A wedding, I think, is not just about the two people getting married, but sort of an opportunity for everyone, the, the yeah. families and friends, to come together on that one occasion and celebrate this milestone together and be a part of it. Yeah. Um, because the bittersweet thing of a marriage is that it's also giving away a little bit, that, that the friends and family of each person getting married is giving that person away a little bit. Which is actually very similar to the situation in the film. Yeah. So, so, and and that's actually the thing I hope the most that even though it, it's uh, you know it's a very small village during the Chinese New Year, um, and uh, there's all these uh, specific uh, details about the history of the family, I, I think there's something to me very relatable about what they experience, uh, whether or not you're gay. I think, um, you know, the expectations that. Um, other people put on us, and also that we put on ourselves, I think is something relatable to a lot of people around the world. Um, so I hope that um, when an audience watches this, um, they'll, they'll think about their own lives and their own relationships with their family. I, I certainly did. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I definitely did too. <laughs> And finally, I wanted to ask about uh, some of the formal decisions in the film. So you, mm. you shot it in black and white. You mm. haven't shot your previous films in black and white. Why, no, I, why um, that decision for this particular film? Why did it suit the um, The only film that I did shoot in black and white prior to this was my very first film at, at New York University, Tish Asia, in Singapore, in graduate school, uh, because we had to. <laughs> um, our first film had to be a MOS, Miton Sound, the black and white short. And um, ever since then, um, I guess there's always the fear that a black and white film, um, it's, you know, less and less common. So there's, uh, there's a fear that it might seem pretentious or, but I guess for me there are two primary reasons. Um, one was very practical. The first day of shooting, uh, the mother wears this uh, um, very flamboyant jacket, which, which is great. It's, uh, I've never seen a jacket like that before, but it literally has like 30 colors on it. And so when I was looking at the footage, I was never looking at her face. I was always looking at her jacket. 
because uh, it's just uh, you can't take your eyes away from that it. That would so not have been what I'd have guessed as the reason. I know, because I know, yeah, in the black and white you could never tell actually. Yeah. It looks like maybe just a few flowers and a black jacket or something. But it, it's a very colorful, and not just for jacket, I should say, um, in a village that hasn't really the thing is, the village hasn't changed that much in a hundred years or longer than that. They just keep adding things, you know. So, so it's just the col there's so many colors in the village, which is interesting in itself. But I wanted it, um, and the second reason was that I very much wanted it, you know, with the snow falling and the dark interiors um, and the lighting that we did for his uh, and the landscapes as well. and the landscapes oh, yeah. and. Um, uh, the way that we shot it also uh, was to actually flatten the landscape. So I wanted it to have this uh, timeless quality. Um, and something that Yao says in the film, how people come, people go, but nothing really changes. Um, when he said that line, I actually, that was when I decided, okay, it has to be in black and white. With this timelessness. And yeah, feeling that uh, I wanted to have this uh, fable quality, actually, fable-like. Like, like uh, even the title, The Silk and the Flame, is something that um, I was inspired not only by what Yao says in the film, but also an Aesop fable. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of the Aesop fables have titles that are, are sort of uh, similar to the one for this particular film. So for me, there was a fable-like quality to the story and the setting. And um, I didn't, you know, it's, it's not, I, I hope that people do take something away from it after they see it, but it's not the kind of documentary that is, uh, you know, trying to teach something. Or it, it's, uh, it's very much more, uh, I hope, offer an experience um, to be with Yao. Um, to understand his strength and his struggle so that way we can reflect upon our own lives. And for me, that was really the, the driving force behind making the film, that I was inspired and um, I was touched and uh, I wanted to make sure that his story and his parents' story and his family's story um, were committed to celluloid. Yeah, not sell you, you know, but film. Yeah. yeah. No, it's definitely something you've done. Well, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you so much for talking to us um, and explaining all these decisions. It's really nice to actually understand a bit more of the backdrop. Yeah. Um, yeah, and enjoy the rest of the Berlinale. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>